exactly welcome and thank you so much for uh coming to this event that's been co-hosted by um ourselves which is don't divide us and um terra firma teaching alliance and i'll let paul say a little bit about our american friends in a moment but just to let you know for those of you that are new don't divide us is a grassroots campaign um we started um shortly after the the now infamous summer of 2020 and our focus now is very much um campaigning around schools and the kind of really negative consequences of identity politics in terms of curriculum standards in terms of school practices and um, in terms of the wider assumptions the wider social political and cultural assumptions that are being endorsed every time a school you know takes on some edi equity diversity and inclusion statement or affirmation so that's us our current projects are in we're very much focused on um setting up we're gathering planning a campaign to um basically try and push um push people to be more responsible whether it's a government or leaders in schools or local council leaders to take responsibility for what is actually entering schools at the moment with no oversight and we're also working on a report to look at the kinds of organizations that are being invited into school um, again with no oversight to teach basically identity politics tenets so um that's us and I'm, we're just really delighted to have our fabulous speakers here who will bring I think are kind of fresh and lesser, you know, lesser discussed aspects about the developmental and sociological aspects to these discussions. So thank you all and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Paul, do you want to tell us a bit about your organization? Oh, yes. And thank you, Elka. Uh, so myself, Paul Rossi, together uh, with Bonnie Snyder, who's also here today, we founded an organization called Terra Firma Teaching Alliance. Uh, we're very proud to co-sponsor this panel today um, with Don't Divide Us. Um, and I think, you know, we're very aligned with them. Um, we're an international network of K through 12. So uh, that's that's the term in uh, the United States. I'm not sure what it would be for, for the, uh, the United Kingdom, but uh, younger, younger students. So, you know, uh, five years old to, to 18 years old. And we're sworn to restore intellectual integrity in classrooms and schools dominated by critical social justice ideology. So we de develop, share, and promote practical ways to bring back balance for our students uh, in terms of viewpoint diversity and narrative diversity. And our motto is pedagogy, not ideology. Uh, so if you are a, um, a K through 12 a teacher, a teacher of young people or care about someone who is, please send them to us. And uh, Carol, at the end, will give you information on how to do that. Thank you. And over now to Carol, who is um, a clinical psychologist, and she's also a very good friend of uh, Don't Divide Us, Critical Therapy Antidote, and hopefully also of Terra Firma Alliance as well. So over to you, Carol. Thank you very much, Alka, and uh, welcome everybody to the end of innocence, what should and shouldn't be taught in schools. Absolutely delighted to welcome our three speakers this evening. Uh, we have Christine Seafan, James Esses and Jenny Bristow, and I'll introduce you to each of them when it comes to their turn to speak. Um, just some kind of basic housekeeping things so that uh, you know what to expect. Um, each of our speakers uh, will talk for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I will let them know verbally when there's five minutes left to speak. After each speaker has given their presentation, there'll be a panel discussion with Christine, James, Jenny and myself for 15 minutes. And then we'll open up to the audience for Q&As for the last half an hour. Uh, and this is just for the audience benefit. Um, you can ask questions or make comments by clicking on the Q&A um, button, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you don't want your name mentioned, because I will read out your questions, then please click on the send anonymously box. And I would ask you if you could keep your questions 
or comments brief, we'd be really appreciative of that. Um, I'll select the questions and read them out. Um, otherwise, just to let you know that audience members will be muted throughout, there will be no chat function until the very end when we'll use it to provide links for Don't Divide Us and Terra Firma. So I think without further ado, we should get started. And uh, first of all, Christine, just like to introduce you to Christine Seifen, our first speaker this evening. Um, Christine is a licensed marriage and family therapist who specializes in grief and trauma with adults and children. Christine was a professor of clinical psychology on a Los Angeles graduate program, and she's now a member of Critical Therapy Antidote, as am I. So welcome, Christine, and let's hear what you have to say. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to come speak. I feel very honored to do that. Um, I just want to uh, say hello to Paul Rossi and Bonnie Schneider. So Paul, I <laughs> long time ago kind of connected with you prior to me finding an organization called FAIR that I ended up working at for a bit of time. And um, this is so timely because as I was moving forward in a different direction from FAIR, right prior to that, I actually started developing material um, on why social or I'm sorry, civil discourse in classrooms K to 12 is essential uh, for their development, their growth, and how critical social justice shuts that down. And there's a lot of interest, we found a lot of interest in how woke ideology, for lack of a better term, or critical social justice, we can say, how does that affect the mental health of these children? Well, there aren't a lot of studies out there because that's not something that's being funded right now, which is part of our problem, obviously. So we had to kind of work backwards in a way and say, okay, how can we make our case by using research and well-known information about child and adolescent development and put that next to critical social justice tenants and show that way how they completely contradict each other. So I developed a very shortened version of this and it was submitted to a conference and immediately we got a response from the conference leaders or, or directors for, um, it was a conference for teachers and educators, et cetera, that not only did they want us to do that presentation, they actually wanted a full day that we would actually look at all of the civil uh, discourse in classrooms and how that contributes positively to development from K to 12, they wanted us to break it down into age groups so that literally we would have a day long instead of a couple of hours to talk about this. So that just demonstrated obviously that the need for this information and for people to actually have something tangible um, that they can point to, to talk about how critical social justice has been very negative for, for children. They've wanted this, they just haven't had a way to find it. So. Anyhow, it was really interesting because Bonnie Schneider's book, Undoctrinated, it was a book I used for quite a bit of information that I found, and it was incredible. It matched up very much to what it was that we were trying to present. So I'm going to try to compress this into 10 minutes and hopefully give you enough information and then answer questions as they come along. So the title of this presentation was, you know, what is, you know, why innocence matters with children, right? So first to kind of just describe a bit about what innocence versus experience really is. And so, you know, as children growing up, which we, I think all have, maybe if you've worked with children, you know, maybe already know some of these concepts, but, you know, the importance of imagination with children allows them to really explore. It opens curiosity up for them and they're able to learn about their environment um, in a safe place if they are supported to do that. And that's part of what innocence is about, is allowing kids to become curious and to be able to tap into parts of their imagination that might have been, you know, that that maybe would, would not be there if they aren't given the space to, or if they're told that they can't, you know, make believe, right? It's how a lot of these children learn about the world around them and about interactions and how people treat one another and how people engage with each other. But in order for them to do that, there needs to be um, a feeling of safety, that the adults around them, that the adults who are caring for them at school and at home are able to uh, create a safe environment and that they'll always be there, that they can always depend on the trust and the safety that they provide um, and not have to fear or worry about what we call adult problems, you know, per se. 
so the children can just be kids. And when they have that innocence, they don't have the life experience that adults do to understand why certain things happen that are, you know, painful or in some way, you know, you know, not not good or not possible, etc. They get to have that space where they don't have to think about that. They don't have to have those fears because they didn't have experiences. Uh, they're not adults. We don't have experiences yet to go ahead and define or make them scared of something. And that's actually very sacred. Um, it's a natural kind of way to help them develop even abstract ideas. They live sort of in this very concrete world, as we know, where things are very rigid. And some of this, um, you know, opens up or the innocence opens up that ability for them to go off into places that are not, you know, where they can start to develop maybe some abstract ideas. So us, you know, adults creating that space using short and simple and truthful answers allow them to learn more about trust, learn more and, and, and to build. And there's sort of this natural kind of defense that we all have in, in children especially, which is called the assumptive worldview. So there's a set of beliefs that we sort of assume to be true and that's what helps us get through life. Uh, so for kids, that's that their parents are gonna be there or that the, you know, the teacher is gonna be there, that there's gonna be consistency and that they're gonna go to school and see their friends and then that it's a place where they know what to expect. And that's important because it helps them be able to have enough, again, support that they feel they can explore because there's safety and security that's built around them. So the assumptive worldview for them is, you know, I'm going to go to school and my teacher's going to be there. My friends are going to be there. This is what we're going to do in class. And this is what I can learn. And this is how I can explore. And adults, you know, for us, we also have an assumptive worldview that's a little bit deeper. Uh, we understand that, you know, we could get into a car accident tomorrow and die. Okay, we need to be no people who have. We've been experienced with that. We've seen it. And so we understand that those things happen. However, we know that it's not likely to happen most of the time. So we live in this kind of assumptive worldview that allows us to move through the world and know that, you know, if you sit there thinking about every possible bad thing that could happen to you based on what's happened in the past and whatnot, it's paralyzing. So that's the same for children. And the innocence component there allows them to be able to explore those things without thinking about the possibility that, you know, their parent could die or some other major tragedy if they haven't experienced it yet. So that's one of the protections that having, you know, that innocent space um, creates. And so why does it matter? Well, you know, the, the critical social justice lens sort of opposes that entire idea. You know, children are very egocentric, as we know. So they believe that everything that happens as a result of their actions, they take blame for things that they're not to blame. Um, for. And that's one of the big, you know, challenges sometimes with kids. And especially when I worked with children who had parents who died, no matter what the cause was, there's always a feeling for them that they somehow contributed it to it. Uh, there was, you know, everything in their world, right, was the result of something they have done. And maybe sometimes they thought it was something they had thought of, et cetera. So that being said, um, when they're starting to think about, you know, behaviors towards them or, or things that happen and they internalize it as it being their fault, that's already going to in some way create a feeling of unsafety. And so this innocence is sort of lost completely when we introduce social justice, social critical justice into the room, especially when you have those thoughts or, or ideals, ideas, ideology that put children in a position to feel guilt. So you have kids that are in you know, let's say first, second, and third grade, at least in the states here, who are being asked to talk about their privilege and asked to talk about why their, you know, their privilege exists, and they're it's separated into groups to do this in some of these schools. And so that right there is shutting down. They've already, as we talked about, have some sense of egocentric ideals. So when they're then broken up into these groups and told about their privilege or lack thereof, they take immediate responsibility and blame for that. You already know that that's how they're thinking. So when you add these tenants into that, we started to erode any kind of innocence or any kind of ability to explore. Now we're telling them what to think and why the way that they look, these immutable characteristics, identity, you know, leading kind of ideals are problematic or why they have been harmed when children may not feel that they have been harmed in any way. But here we are telling them that. So they're not, and I saw that again, as I mentioned, just with the death, not being able to understand that, you know, you, you're not responsible for everything that happens around you. So with critical social justice, we're already starting off on that foot of trying to put responsibility and blame into their lap. So 
So, you know, what we really want to be doing, however, is titrating information for them. We want to be open and honest and help them grow. How do we do that? Well, we titrate information to suit their developmental needs. You know, somebody at the age of six doesn't have the cognitive uh, sophistication as somebody who's 16, for example. So we want to tailor and titrate what we know they can handle based on their own cognitive sophistication at various ages and age groups. And, you know, we already are sort of battling the access to social media and pornography and uncontrolled, you know, internet to where children are already being exposed to things that they can't fully grasp or understand at a young age that sort of erodes, again, this innocence where they're being shown and in a sense told what to think or what to do or how to think about ideas. I, it just comes to mind for me that, you know, I had a really good friend, his daughter, who's six years old. Um, and this friend of mine lives in North Carolina in Cal in uh, the, the U.S., very usually considered to be a very conservative state. But the daughter comes home and says to, to her mom, you know, I'm, I, I just want to know if I'm a boy or a girl. And her mom says, well, you're a girl. You're my daughter. You know, why is that? Or, you know, why are you asking? Well, they tell us at school that we can choose whether we're a boy or a girl. So in that way, there's that kind of innocence there, this idea coming in that just completely uh, it's impossible to sort of understand that she had a hard time grasping that. So that's just kind of a little bit of the, the puzzle here. Chris, um, and because sorry, five yeah, minutes, I did. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to move on. So um, thank you. because children think magically, but also concretely, um, you know, we have to be able to incorporate as we're teaching them some, you know, actual tangible facts and also, you know, to help them understand that, you know, there's still that space to have the, the growth of exploration. Um, at that moment, though, however, you know, at six years old, she she was very confused and that left a lot of you know open questions and difficulty to where some of the things she felt then guilty of being a girl. Let's just kind of put it that way, um, because, you know, there was a whole narrative around why that was not good. So what they need to grow up healthy, you know, we need kids to be able to have challenges and stressors. All of us do. We all have them. That's what helps us produce and goal and uh, reach goals. But the ideology of CSJ by its very nature, it boxes people, it groups people. There's a group think, uh, mass formation, and it ignores kind of this impact versus intent, which is where we come up with microaggressions, comments that are made that are somehow interpreted to be harmful or an assault, verbal assault that really do not necessarily have the intent behind that. So when we're giving people that information and telling these kids about these things, we're not allowing them to explore. One of the simplest things is to just ask the question, what did you mean by that? Or help me understand what you meant by that, rather than diving in into assumptions, which is what's happening with these kids. And it's a lot for them to try to understand and bear um, on their shoulders. So we're not, you know, we want to teach them reasoning through facts and through, you know, present pre presentation of material not necessarily motivated by emotion because we know emotions are fleeting and that if we respond emotionally or they learn to respond from an emotional place rather than a place of a more grounded factual uh, um, center, which is why SCNL, you know, social emotional learning is problematic, then, you know, these kids are operating, for, are going to learn to operate from that place. Even in ther psychotherapy, that traditional psychotherapy with adults, we know that in order to make decisions, we want people to sort of you know, de-escalate and, and self-soothe to an extent and to get to a place of a rational, neutral, you know, point and that they can think more clearly that way. That's where they can make decisions from. And so these, you know, children are not being given kind of the space to do that through things like social and emotional learning, that that active part of us that critical thinking is not there. And in classic education, I want to quote something that um, Bonnie wrote in her book about what we really truly expect in classical education is the role of educators, which is to function as temporary guardians of other children um, and to not exceed their assigned occupational boundaries and defer to recognize parental authority uh, re regarding beliefs in the hands-off zone. That educators are not there to dictate values. They're there to present information and to enforce you know, rules and boundaries in the classroom essentially but not in parenting, not in telling the children how to think or what to think, but in presenting information. Um, and they le learn tools to manage failure or disappointment. Um, they understand that mistakes or failing doesn't mean they're a failure. So we start to separate action from behavior in school, that you can still do something bad and be a good person. You don't have to be defined by that. How do you correct it? 
And school serves as that primary environment, a second primary environment, where it's a microcosm, in a sense, of what's happening at the world at large. And so teachers coming in with biases that are social justice minded are going to bring in a lot of those beliefs and ideals that's going to shut down conversation in other areas. Because the CSJ, the problem with boundaries with critical social justice is both that the boundaries are too porous, meaning that the in, uh, educators say and think whatever, or say whatever they think and believe, their own ideological pol you know, philosophies, they taint the classroom with that. And they're too rigid on the other extreme where those very same teachers because of this ideology, do not allow exploration of other ideas because of the narrative that is already been drawn out. And so rather than, you know, being able to have other ideas and whatnot, that becomes a really um, threatening environment because it's already been shown by the teacher presenting the idea that this is how to think. And this is also talked about a little bit in coddling of the American mind, where we're not preparing our students for obstacles that they're going to face outside of the classroom. And this is at any age. Um, we focus a little bit on college age uh, people, but this is really it's prevalent from you know the very first time they start school. They're learning about microcosm of the world at large, and the core tenets of CSJ does not allow for them to explore something beyond that. And that can lead to again, as I mentioned, the boundary problems. Um, but alienation and judging, if a child or adolescent thinks differently, they're either going to do one of two things. They're either going to hide that and they're going to feel shame that they've hidden what they truly think and they're going to think they're a bad person. Or they may go ahead and, you know, go along with something or say it, you know, out loud and then be treated terribly as a result. Most of the kids are going to hide it and go along with what the narrative is. They're not going to risk saying something and feeling badly about it later. So that causes a lot of confusion and a lot of internal anguish. I don't really believe this, but this is what people are telling me to believe. And I'm trying to take my cues as a young person and I want to be included and I want to belong. And Christine, it's just collectivism. Yes, I'm Christine, sorry. I'm, or, yes, so so, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I could let you go on all evening. I, I'm just, okay, yeah, okay. I, okay, I'll just <laughs> Thank say the last you so much. <laughs> The whole things of safetyism versus safeguarding. I know we, that was we one can of the things. That. We can discuss that in our panel discussion. Hold on to that thought, Christine. Hold on to that Sorry, thought. Sorry, everybody. Thank I know Thank a lot. Thank you so Thank you. much for Christine Seifen. Thank um, you. James, if I can just introduce um, James Esses now, um, who's our next uh, panellist. So James is a writer, uh, commentator and co-founder of Thoughtful Therapists, which is a, a group of like-minded therapists in the UK and Ireland who are concerned about the impact of gender identity ideology on children and on young people. So welcome, James, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol, and hello, everyone. It's good to be here with you all. Um, and I'd start by just listing a few core principles that I believe should be in education and in the children's education system. And I'm going to go on and elaborate on those afterwards. But they are no indoctrination, safeguarding, transparency for parents and free speech. And what is currently happening, particularly around gender ideology, which is the perspective that I'm approaching this topic from, throws these principles completely under the bus. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just offering a bit of a context, a bit of a framework around gender ideology before looking at it in the educational context. Um, my starting point is always the same, which is that it's perfectly reasonable to believe that sex is binary and immutable, and also to believe that those struggling with their identities deserve respect, uh, support, proper mental health treatment, these ideals are not mutually exclusive, even though many always try to paint them out to be as such. Secondly, it's that gender dysphoria, this debilitating mismatch between one's sex and one's identity, is a mental health condition. In the United Kingdom, in order to be able to transition legally or medically, you must be diagnosed with it. And yet, it is the only mental health condition that is treated by affirming distressing thoughts inside somebody's head or trying to physically change their body. Now, we know from research that the vast majority of children with gender dysphoria who are left alone will settle into themselves and their bodies. However, we also see studies demonstrating that starting a child on puberty blockers is a slippery slope towards greater medicalization. And we know the significant detrimental impact that cross-sex hormones can have, including leaving a child potentially infertile. 
And so too, when we consider sex reassignment surgery, uh, leaving a, a young person losing a part of their body that they can never get back again. And from an ethical perspective, I always find it strange that we have a society in which a child may not be able to vote in an election or, or buy a, a lottery ticket or a scratch card, but they can consent to irreversible experimental treatment with no long-term studies and growing numbers of detransitioners. So moving on to the educational context now and a bit of a case study, because I believe that the influence of these ideologies is coming from the top down. And I'd like to look at the Secretary of State for Education in the United Kingdom, uh, a lady called Gillian Keegan. And Miss Keegan has been described by Pink News as a, quote, rare LGBTQ plus ally. And she previously declared unambiguously that in her opinion, quote, trans women are women. Now, Miss Keegan recently appeared before the United Kingdom Select Committee that's run by the Department of Education. And she had her attention drawn to recent polling in the UK, which demonstrates that 75% of children have been exposed to critical social justice theories. And 68% of those children have said that they were taught that those theories were either fact or that alternative views were not acceptable. And she was told very plainly by some of her parliamentary colleagues that this was indoctrination. And her response was to ask bemusedly, is it? She was then provided with a, a, a case study um, of a, a grandfather whose five-year-old grandson came home from school one day and told him that he was being taught about, quote, being born in the wrong body. Well, Gillian Keegan denied there was any issue, saying that she hadn't witnessed this in schools herself. And she went on to say, quote, I have not found any problem with freedom of speech from the teachers that I mix with. And I would submit that this demonstrates naivety and, dare I say, willful ignorance from those at the top when it comes to our children's education. And to make matters worse, you will all have seen the recent debate around self-ID and gender recognition in Scotland. And a question was posed to Miss Keegan as to whether 16-year-olds were old enough to legally change their sex. And Miss Keegan says that they were. And this was on the basis that when she was 16, she had a job and paid taxes. Uh, and I would say that this needs no comment. The, the lunacy speaks for itself. So moving on to ideological materials and indoctrination, because the stakes are extremely high and we need to look at the social contagion element that's at play for children. Over recent years, we've seen a complete inversion in the sex ratio of those presenting as trans. We already know that young people, particularly young girls, can fall prey to contagion. We've seen this historically with eating disorders and self-harm. In recent years, we've seen this in relation to Tourette's syndrome, a condition that historically was dominated by males. I hear of more and more schools in which multiple girls in a single classroom are coming out as trans within weeks of each other. And I also came across a, a research study which showed that two thirds of trans identifying young people had one or more friends who are also identifying as trans. And so I thought I'd give a few examples of some of the most heinous uh, indoctrination materials that I've come across being taught to children in both primary and secondary schools. There's a book called Phoenix Goes to School. It's recommended for the ages of five and plus. And the synopsis of the book is, quote, a gender non-conforming transgender seven-year-old girl who was assigned male at birth and currently identifies with she, her, hers pronouns. And in this book, young boys are told that if they like smelling flowers, they might actually be trapped in the wrong body. There's another book, it's called It Feels Good to Be Yourself. And in this book, children are taught, quote, see, when you were born, you couldn't tell people who you were or how you felt. They looked at you and made a guess. Maybe they got it right. Maybe they got it wrong. And in my submission, this is both factually inaccurate and highly dangerous. I've come across history teaching materials suggesting that Joan of Arc was actually trans. That is the very literal rewriting of history. I've come across examples of ideology being snuck in through the back door. I came across a teaching lesson plan for computing lessons. And this lesson was to teach children about computer coding and binary computing language. And teachers were instructed at the end of the lesson to contrast 
computer code, which is binary, with human beings' gender, which is non-binary. Completely and utterly irrelevant. I've come across a workbook which lists out all of the various multicolored flags of the endless numbers of genders and sexualities that a child may identify as. And then there's two boxes, one that says cis and one that says straight. And there is no flag, it's simply the white page in the background. And I would submit that this suggests to impressionable young children that it's not trendy or cool to be straight or cis. I've come across girls' schools in which there are uh, gender alliances that have been set up by 17-year-old students in the school, including trans-identified boys, and they are running presentations after school for young girls as young as 11 years old, often without teachers being present. I've even come across school inspection reports which have marked primary schools down on the basis that they haven't, quote, celebrated being trans. So moving on to safeguarding now, because schools up and down the United Kingdom and across the globe are facilitating, enabling and even encouraging transitioning of children and they're keeping it hidden from children's parents. Now trans rights groups have long dismissed these concerns. They've claimed this is just mere social transitioning, a soft option, wearing different clothes, adopting different pronouns, using preferred toilet and changing facilities. However, UK government commission research has found that such social transition is an active intervention because it may have significant effects on a child's psychological function. James, for, sorry to interrupt you, five minutes. Thank, thank you. you. For a school not to disclose that a child might be struggling with gender dysphoria a mental health condition, a condition is a dereliction of their duty of care to both parents and children. Not that schools seem particularly worried about keeping parents in the dark. Uh, the charity Stonewall argues that a person's status as trans is private and that schools should not disclose this information, including to parents or carers. And in fact, they seem to actively encourage misleading parents. For example, Stonewall's guidance encourages teachers to continue to use a child's legal name when meeting with his or her parents, even if the child has socially transitioned at school and is being referred to by a new name and pronouns. The, the aim here clearly to pull the wool over the eyes of concerned parents. What about the sexualization of children? Because as adults, it's fundamental that we safeguard and protect our children from harm. And this includes sexual harm. There's a reason why we have an age of sexual consent or age limits on selling pornographic materials to minors. But overt or inappropriate sexualization of children is also harmful. And children lacking proper developmental capacity should not find themselves being exposed to inappropriate sexual themes. However, we've witnessed a slow creep towards the sexualization of children shrouded in the midst of diversity. And we see this most clearly in the drag performances that are going on in schools around the United Kingdom. Many modern day drag performances ooze sex. They're hypersexualized in language and dress. They can blur the boundaries between adults and children. Crucially, they're promoted to children as something that they may wish to aspire towards. And they promote and encourage regressive sexist stereotypes of what it means to be a woman. The most well-known of these in the United Kingdom is Drag Queen Story Hour, where the performer is often wearing such tight-fitted clothing that his genitals are visible to the children watching. And often at the end of the performance, the performer will have the children in the classroom pose next to the trans pride flag, demonstrating that they're showing allegiance to an ideology. Does this sound appropriate? And yet parents who speak out against this are frequently smeared as transphobes or bigots. What about free speech? I recently came across a PE teaching guidance which suggests that if a young female student doesn't want to play sport against a, a trans girl, i.e. a biological boy, in a competition, that girl is transphobic. Uh, we're literally putting the fear of God in our children about speaking out. And then, of course, we've got my own case, because many of you will know that I was expelled from a master's degree in psychotherapy after speaking out about my concerns regarding gender ideology and the mental health profession. And I was expelled over a single email with no evidence, no hearing, no appeal, uh, no conversation whatsoever. And since then, I've decided to take litigation against my, my university, but I'm contacted by significant numbers of students and even tutors on a daily basis who are too scared to speak out in their own institution. So in conclusion, indoctrination is rife. Safeguarding is being undermined. Parents are being alienated. Children are facing increased sexualization, 
and free speech is being shut down. And I say that we must act before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. That that was really interesting. Thank you so much. We'll come back to you when we kept to the panel discussion. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Jenny Bristow. And Jenny is a senior lecturer and associate of the Centre for Parenting Studies. And she's also a writer and commentator. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, um, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm sorry my video won't turn on. I think the host might need to turn it on for me. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here. I am, in fact, here. Um, so, um, writing in 1996... Jenny, Neil sorry. Postman... Jenny, sorry, you can turn your video on now. Oh, can I? Excellent. Well, not excellent, really. I mean, you know. Oh, there, there I am. Right. Um, <laughs> Neil Postman, um, author of the uh, 1982 book, The Disappearance of Childhood, um, summarised the long-standing division over the purpose of education. And I can see in the Q&A that there's a question about Neil Postman, so maybe this will go some way to addressing that question. Um, anyway, so he said in 1986 that US citizens believe in two contradictory reasons for schooling. One is that schools must teach the young to accept the world as it is, with all of their culture's rules, requirements, constraints, and even prejudices. The other is that the young should be taught to be critical thinkers so that they become men and women of independent mind, distanced from conventional wisdom of their own time and with the strength and skill enough to change what is wrong. And Postman says, each of these beliefs is part of a unique narrative of what it means to be human what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be intelligent. And each of these narratives can be found in the American tradition. Um, and I think, you know, you can, within the sociology of education, you can kind of see this broadly as mapping the kind of uh, sort of debate between the so-called consensus and conflict perspectives on education that have long formed the basis of debates about the role of schools, the purpose of schooling. Um, over the kind of certainly the, the uh, latter half of the 20th century. I think with the culture wars currently raging around what should and shouldn't be taught in schools, we, we are seeing a version of this argument actually, but I think we're seeing it with an important difference. So the argument that seems to, we seem to be having now is not about how educators should encourage pupils to think about what to know, but the extent to which schools should be directly instructing pupils in how to be. And this raises a profound set of tensions, which is really what I want to briefly outline uh, in these few minutes. So we know that schools don't just educate children, they, they also socialise them. But the socialisation that happens in schools is very different to what happens in the home. The home provides children with their formative experiences and a set of close relationships within which they can develop, gradually working out who they are in themselves. The school, on the other hand, introduces children to the world beyond the norms, rules and expectations of society in general. And as children grow older, they work out who they are in the world. Now, I'm aware that this process is not as straightforward as all of that, um, but I think it's crucial to recognise for the purposes of, of this discussion that for all of their overlaps and imperfections, home and school play different roles in children's development. We confuse them at our peril. Um, since, certainly since the turn of the 20th, 21st century, there have been increasing concerns that the boundaries of the home and school are becoming blurred. Teachers, through having to play an expanded safeguarding role, are expected to become more and more involved in people's emotional welfare and well-being, to the point where teachers often complain that they're being tasked with the role of social workers uh, rather than teachers. And parents feel that they have to account to the school for private family matters. Parents, meanwhile, are expected to take on responsibilities that should properly belong to the school, such as teaching kids to read, you know, the, the dreaded reading record for parents in the UK, which you have to sign every night to show that your child has read something to you. Um, Co-producing homework, <laughs> not just making them do the homework, but actually working on it with them. Um, providing enriching extracurricular educational opportunities and so on. And this blurring of roles and boundaries between home and school um, relates to deeper uncertainties about what it means to raise children, um, what it means to raise children as a parent and as an educator. And in this sense, parents and teachers are kind of struggling with the same problem. 
which is a, a kind of a wider um, cultural cultural issue. As I see it, both the, the, the problem is that both the family and the schools are institutions that should stand between the child and the influences of society as a whole. So the family, as a haven in a heartless world, to borrow the title of Christopher Lash's 1977 book, provides a space for children and adults to be nourished within intimate bonds of, at least ideally, unconditional love and obligation. And I think both of those things are important. I think the obligation that comes with the family is, is really significant. The school um, mediates or should mediate society's accumulated knowledge via the curriculum and via pedagogy to give the child the tools to understand and shape the world that they inherit. And the school also should mediate the rules of society to become something that the child comes to learn gradually and in an appropriate, and in an appropriate way. So discipline starts with, you know, training four-year-olds for the nativity play. And then it kind of develops with teenagers into de detentions for bad behavior. The, the assumption in a school isn't that a child comes in knowing the rules um, and the, the penalty for breaking the rules should be you know, calling the police or something. You know, you treat children differently to the way that you treat adults. But as time has gone on, both, the, both institutions, the family and the school, have come under increasing pressure to be just like society. In other words, their role is kind of seen to be less to mediate external influences than to channel them directly to the child. So just for example, schools are pushed you know, increasingly to focus explicitly on developing things like employability skills and relationship skills. Um, the, the, the net effect of all of the things that schools are supposed to be doing with children and training them to do is to kind of edge out abstract curriculum knowledge in favour of instruction in matters that um, are considered to be directly relevant to present day events and experiences. I mean, I think we saw this really starkly around the, uh, during the pandemic, the extent to which schools kind of became completely reorganised um, around so social distancing rules and kind of public health concerns, the, the, the present day crisis. Um, and the project of education really receded into the background. It became kind of like a, a thing that you were just trying to kind of get through. Um, and I think, that's, I think that was a very telling moment. I think we can see it in relation to this discussion in the speed with which the equality, diversity and inclusion agenda that's becoming so dominant in corporate culture and public services is now funneled directly to children through instruction on thinking a certain way about gender, race, climate change and, and, and so on. And this is seen to be you know, considered to be entirely appropriate as the, you know, the thing that school should do. The difficulty is that parents often actually endorse the idea that what school should be doing is not really imparting knowledge um, and what it should be doing is preparing children for, for life and, and the world. Um, and the fact that some parents are um, now pushing back against some of the more extreme aspects of the woke curriculum, as it's sometimes called, I don't think should distract us from the degree to which many parents have absorbed wider cultural imperatives to make education kind of almost like just as a reflection of real life and also to, to want schools to be directly engaged with children's emotional worlds. Um, so I think it, it is quite a, a complicated and, and deep-seated problem. And the idea that schools should channel the world as it directly is to, you know, as, as it, sorry, sorry, should channel the world as it is directly to children is the kind of real underlying problem here, because it leads to a situation in which another crucial boundary becomes blurred, not just the boundary between home and school, but the boundary between adult and child. Um, and here, by way of conclusion, I, I want to go back to Postman, this time his, his classic text, um, Disappearance of Childhood. So writing in the early 1980s, Postman was concerned that the rise of new technologies, which at this time was largely television he was talking about, uh, was disrupting the all important kind of boundary between adult and child or adulthood and childhood. His thesis was that the emergence of childhood as a distinct state of being was closely connected to the development of the printing press and the emergence of, of print culture. So reading essentially was just extremely significant in the demarcation of this thing called adulthood and this thing called childhood. Um, before, the printed, before printing culture, adults and children had inhabited an oral culture 
where experience had been shared directly and without mediation. So in a sense, they were all inhabiting the same, the, the same world. Children in many ways were like kind of little adults. Um, but with the development of reading, um, adults and children began to live in different worlds. Access to the wider world opened up through the printed word required that children become educated in the skills to read and also required that they, they had the time to develop the maturity to understand what they were reading. And so then you had the, the, the beginning of this kind of process of socialization through a very self-conscious exercise of adult responsibility. Um, socialization really through education, through the establishment of education and the medium of the printed word became um, a mediated and controlled process. Childhood became established as a haven from the extremes and excesses of the wider adult world to which children were introduced gradually. And so what Postman was talking about with television was he said, well, what happens with television is that this all important preparation for encounters with adult culture that you get through reading um, becomes negated. He said, in learning to interpret the meaning of images, we do not require lessons in grammar or spelling or logic or vocabulary. We require no analog of the McGuffey reader, no, pre no preparation, no prerequisite training. Watching television not only requires no skills, but develops no skills. The essential point is that TV presents information in a form that is undifferentiated in its accessibility. And this means that television does not meet, need to make distinctions between the categories child and adult. Now, for those, those of us who have grown up with television, you know, I mean, it is tempting to kind of see this analysis from 50 years, I mean, it really is 50 years ago, I was counting it up, I blimey. It's tempting to see this analysis as kind of rather cranky, and um, certainly in the UK, it's tempting to hark back to a more innocent TV age where we had three or four channels with rigidly programmed children's TV. And you know, to kind of contrast that sort of age of t t television innocence, if you like, with the always accessible character of, of channels now, um, and let alone access to the much wider and undifferentiated range of less appropriate content on the internet and, and social media. But I think you know, in terms of Postman's main point, I think that point uh, really kind of stands, um, is something very important to engage with, not only about the door, the, 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 the distinction between adults and children broken down by technology itself, but as a kind of a metaphor for uh, the problem of a wider undifferentiated culture, which fails to mediate between adult culture and concerns on the one hand, and what children need to know on the other. Jenny, we have about five minutes, sorry. Thank fine, you. That's fine, I'm nearly done. Um, and actually, in terms of this kind of wider point, this was the point that, that uh, Christopher Lash made back in 1977, where he talked about the family, the problem of the family being increasingly kind of pervaded by cultural influences from the world outside, not only TV, but kind of cultural norms around youth culture and you know, various others, um, and policy dynamics, um, all of which competed with the authority of the parent over the socialization of children. And one of those kind of competing authorities was schools and the official agencies operating through them. So in this way, the discussion concern about the end of innocence and parental authority specifically has been going on a long time, has, as has concern about the, the kind of gradual erosion of the distinction between adults and child. So uh, just, the question that that begs is why it's erupted so starkly now. And I think largely that's one I, I'll leave for the discussion because I haven't actually got any answers on that apart from one suggestion and um, give my apologies if this is a bit bleak. Um, because I'd like to think it's that parents have suddenly decided that you know, they're, they're really confident um, about the importance of education and the values by which they want to raise their children. And they've decided to kind of rise up against all of this. Um, I don't think that's really the case. I think it's more uh, the other way. I think it's because the wider culture, the so-called real life that is promoted by the so-called woke curriculum has become so uh, divisive and, and so detached actually from the reality that many people perceive that it's no longer possible to continue in this, this state we've been in for the past 50 years of just kind of accepting the school and the family as kind of coexisting if competing sources of authority. I think that the, the tension has become too um, obvious and too extreme. Um, so, 
I think this polarisation is no bad thing in that it brings to a head tensions that have been growing for several decades and do need to be argued out. Um, but the extent to which it pits parents and teachers or the family and the home against each other is not the ideal form that such a confrontation should take because it's a, it's a deeper cultural confrontation. Um, just to close, I would say that both families and schools are crucial in raising and educating the younger generation and preserving childhood as a space in which children can grow and flourish, protected from the febrile cultural conflicts that beset the adult world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Three really excellent presentations. Thank you all very much indeed. I think what we'll do now is we'll have uh, 15 minutes just to discuss some of this uh, before we open up to Q&As with the audience. Um, I think the, the kind of theme that I'm getting that, that's coming through here is the importance of innocence for children to give them a, a safe space. I hate using that term, but yeah, give them a safe space in which to develop their imagination, to grow and to feel secure, um, not to actually force adult responsibilities onto them, but that both James and Jenny have made this point that there is a real blurring of boundaries that has been going on for some time between adults and children. And I, I've been reading Frank Faraday about this and, and the importance of boundaries and the importance of borders. And it feels as though this sort of breaking down of the difference between adults and children is leading us into really quite um, difficult territory here. So I think we've looked you know, quite a bit at the idea that innocence is important, in, perhaps it isn't the myth that, that it's made out to be. Um, we've talked quite a bit about why innocence matters, uh, because it's protecting children from the adult world. And Christine's talked quite a lot about the developmental uh, requirements of children and how critical social justice actually encroaches on this by making young children take on the kind of adult responsibilities and the sense of blame that when you're quite young, you blame yourself for bad things that have happened. And so, you know, quite a lot of this segregation of children, putting them into different groups according to skin colour, um, actually will make children feel really responsible for the past and bad things that they believe they've done, but it's actually nothing to do with them and it's not their responsibility. So it's quite a lot going on here. Um, I, I guess what I'd quite like to think about is, you know, we've looked at the damage, you know, we've considered what, what the damage is. What can we do about it? Uh, and I'd like to put this to the panel because I'm sure the audience will have their ideas too. What can we actually do about this situation that we find ourselves in? Yeah, Charles? <laughs> okay, don't mind. Day, yes, I have uh, to because I, it, yes, it's, uh, I'm so sorry. I had so much to, to talk about and needed to keep that um uh closer to minutes. but one one point i didn't get to yeah is that something we're seeing a lot of too when we talk about the difference between safetyism and safeguarding safeguarding being the boundaries and the containment the limits that we want to set for children in school and in at home and etc versus safetyism which is where we want to protect them from thinking or feeling or being uncomfortable in any way. And so one of the things that's very problematic that's happening here in California is the discussion of the removal of grades altogether. So the University of San Diego, University of California at San Diego, professor came out and spoke on why he felt that grades, giving grades to college students was not um, effective. And so the arguments there on the K through 12 level, because they have a similar one, is that we don't want these kids to feel as though they're in any way not smart or they're not intelligent, completely dismissing whether or not that particular child or college student actually did the work or actually studied or read the books. And there's this idea of equity where the outcome uh, needs to be equal across the board, regardless of merit and regardless of the work and the things that have been put in. When we talk about equality, we're talking about equality of access to resources, access to books and access to information and you know tutors and whatnot. But equity is not the same thing. And those two things are getting blurred so that no matter what you do, we want everybody to come out with an equal you know, outcome or an outcome that doesn't reflect merit or working hard for something, which then brings down the motivation of all of the children. 
because there's no reason for them at that point to strive for anything that's too great because no matter what, the person that is also in class is also going to receive the same grade as me. And that has been something that is a huge issue, all under this guise of trying to protect the kids. It's safetyism, protect them from feeling uncomfortable, protect them from feeling feelings of failure or disappointment, rather than allowing them to understand that their consequences action directly affect outcomes for them, at least in a controlled environment like a classroom. And so that's something that's been very um, uh, problematic. And I believe in New York State, there is something that has been presented uh, on the legislative level to actually remove gifted and honors programs altogether. Because the word gifted could be interpreted by other people as though if these people are in a gifted class, these students, then they're talented. And then I am not because I am not in a gifted program. So this sweeping overall you know, change to, to try to get people to an equal playing field that dismisses also to the motivation to try harder and any kind of reason to try to you know, over, you know, to, to, to reach this level of excellence. And then at the same time, it's also saying that we don't believe all the students can reach that level of excellence and we don't want them to feel badly about it versus, hey, some of us, you know, may not have the, talent. I would love to be, a, you know, a singer. I never had the talent to do it. So <laughs> the acceptance of no or the acceptance of every, or, or, or the, you know, the action of everybody gets an A doesn't allow for people to learn how to deal with uncomfortable feelings or, or feeling as though you failed something. So that's one thing I wanted to just put out there because the removal of grades now and these gifted programs is really uh, sending a message there that's incredibly dangerous. Okay, thank you, Christine. Do, Jenny, do you have any views on that? Yeah, so in, following that, I think you know, safetyism is a real problem. Um, and I think there's a, um, I think one thing in terms of what we can do, I think it's very difficult, but I think, um, one thing has been to be really guard against this confusion um, about the difference between children and then adults protect projections of what children are doing and experiencing and thinking. Um, because, you know, children, I mean, and this is a, a couplet that I, I have stolen from Frank Ferreira. Um, <laughs> he says, you know, children are simultaneously infantilized and adultified in today's culture. That's how confused that we are. You know, so we are protecting them from a lot of stuff that they probably need to experience. And at the same time, kind of dumping on them all of these existential anxieties of adult society. Um, and, you know, in a, in a very kind of a mediated way. So I think safety is really problematic. I actually have a problem with safeguarding as well. You know, this thing called safeguard is quite a new concept. I think it that developed in the 1980s and onwards, I think. People didn't used to talk about safeguarding in this way. And when you look at what it means, it is this like really kind of weirdly formalized, abstracted notion of what we, we as adults are supposed to be doing with children. Like we're just supposed to sort of surveil them and look for potential dangers and, you know, what, what's the phrase, you know, escalate, you know, and pass on concerns and all of that. And I see safeguarding as really emerging actually as a kind of a consequence of the crumbling of the more implicit sense of adult responsibility that we should have for children and I think in terms of taking back control of like what we ought to be doing with children um, I think it's it's really kind of getting back to that sense of as adults we just should we just should protect them you know That's interesting. Not because yeah, we've got a badge know. or because yeah. it's a process and, and stop being so scared of ticking the wrong box or whatever mm. and, and just say look we are adults we know mm. um I can understand that. I'm really interested to hear what you think about that, James, because this is something I know is very close to your heart, this idea that you know, children so young are being you know, sort of encouraged to think of themselves in an adult way and to take decisions, life changing decisions about their bodies and uh, you know, which you've kind of been, I don't know, I think as a parent, I just feel that's wrong. And I think that's probably what you're trying to get at, Jenny, is that we we kind of lost that sense of being parents and being adults and make, making decisions on behalf of our children. And now it's kind of been labelled as safeguarding. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. James, do, do tell us your thinking about this. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of pick up on the point around boundaries because I think there's a few different boundaries that are being blurred. Thinking about what being a teacher should stand for. And I think historically, you know, and still today, certain people will go into this, you know, with noble aims in terms of imparting, you know, a factual but neutral education upon children free of ideology or indoctrination. Well, the kind of modern culture today sees people first and foremost as social justice activists. And then secondly, whatever their actual vocation is. And we see this through some of the wearing materials coming across on social media, on TikTok, where you're seeing these teachers who seem to view it's, that it's their job to actually impart this ideology, these beliefs upon children. And that comes before, you know, the, the notion of being a teacher. Um, and I think the blurring of boundaries between adulthood and childhood is interesting. I think we're causing a lot of confusion for kids. And there's an interesting dynamic at play because, you know, I've, I've spoken to parents who have had their kids come home from school and said we were taught, you know, we, we were born in the wrong body. And the parent sits down with the child and tries to say to them, well, actually, that's not true. And the child says, but if my teacher, if my teacher says it, it must be true. So you've got, got that element of I must always believe my teachers. But you've also got the element that people like Greta Thunberg, et cetera, have brought into the world, which is this idea that adults are responsible for the failure of the world and we should never listen to them. And anything an adult tells us, we should simply ignore because we know better. It's, it's an interesting dynamic. Isn't it, James? It must be very confusing for children to, to try and understand that. OK, so <clears throat> it kind of seems that um, we can we can all agree, I think, that the safetyism is not a good route to go down. Um, and I know Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff have talked about this a great deal, haven't they? Um, but by the same token, you know, safeguarding is something that you would expect parents and teachers to, to do without actually having to give it a label. Um, I'm just kind of thinking about this kind of whole so social justice activism, which, which seems to be the main raison d'etre for everybody now, doesn't it? Whether you're a psychologist or a teacher, you know, whatever um, institution you happen to be working in, this seems to be this kind of need to change the world is the overriding factor. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and needing to change the world and acknowledging where you have in some way contributed to the problem or created the problem. So it's taking responsibility in that way. And the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, we're telling kids that are six, seven, eight years old mm -hmm. uh, that they are responsible for because of an immutable characteristic, whatever the historical issues of the past of our country, at least here in the States, mm -hmm. at six and seven years old, when they don't um, have any kind of understanding even about their own identity yes, and who they are. They're just yeah. ba barely learning how to start you know, being a little bit independent or trying to figure out their life for this life. And they're being told at that age already that they're responsible to change the world and they're responsible for the way that they were born. And no matter what you do, you can't get out of that. And that's the problem with CSJ in general. There's no out. There's no answer at the end because Nobody is ever going to be not racist. Nobody is ever really, you know, unless you're, I mean, if you're white, you're never going to be not racist. So if you're not actively doing something daily as an anti-racist, that's uh, then the only other option. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, this problem isn't meant to be solved. So we're already presenting these ideas uh, that are ludicrous overall, but especially the kids that are that young and don't have a sense yet of much outside of what, you know, their school or or their family life is like, and that's extremely dangerous. Again, it's putting all of this on them for you know whatever historical you know issues have happened here that they have nothing to do with. Mm. I'm, I'm also wondering to what degree technology is feeding into this. I mean, we've mentioned, I think all of you have mentioned social media, um, and that actually the kids may well be picking up quite a lot of this from social media, like climate change worries and so on. <clears throat> and that they, you know, at school, perhaps it's not just at school they're learning these things, but it's also in the you know, privacy of their own bedrooms as well, depending yes. on. Yes. And I just want to make one comment about that. Sorry. And then Jenny, I'll pass it to you. <laughs> but we, I, when I was working a couple of years ago at um, a care clinic in a high school, majority of the kids that came in for kind of emergency therapy or sort of crisis counseling, majority of them, I would say over 95% uh, were coming in because of things that were going on 
that they found out about on Instagram. So they find out that somebody's doing something with whomever and my boyfriend's cheating on whomever and they're coming in and they're wanting to kill themselves. We had three suicides in one high school alone in 2019. And when we went back to sort of look at what the circumstances were and what those kids, they were for, for circumstances that are changeable and will change. They were not necessarily, you know, mental health conditions that triggered that in these kids. And it was more situational, circumstantial. And that's what the studies show as well in adolescence. So those circumstances that are changeable, but this over access to social media is where they're seeing and finding things out and whatnot. And that is, you know, creating these impossible feelings that they cannot control of pain and suffering. And then we're seeing suicide attempts and all of that increasing at rapid rates. So mm -hmm. I think it's a huge part of it. Um, and especially because the changeable circumstances um, that, you know, these kids are not waiting to act on impulse, the difficulty with distress tolerance of difficult emotion, all of those kinds of things contribute to, I need to end this now. I cannot bear it. And I can't barely even, you know, take in uh, the idea of, of calming down. So mm -hmm. we, we, it was, and then we saw suicide uh, groups come up where, you know, their group of several kids, when one kid decides to kill themselves, the rest will follow. I mean, it was absolutely like an epidemic level. So mm -hmm. uh, we, I'll turn it over to Jenny uh, so you yeah. can jump in there. Thank you, Christine. Jen, Jenny, did you want to add to that? Um, yes, I just want to say one thing about the safeguarding, which actually Amanda has raised in the chat. Now, I just think it's important in relation to what you were saying, Carol. You see, the, the people who do, do, don't do safeguarding are parents. No one ever talks about parents mm -hmm. as being safeguarders. Children are always safeguarded against the parents. And that's the dynamic here. And I think that that's one thing that I think is just kind of quite important to um, unpack um, in all of these discussions. I think, I, look, I think the social media is kind of huge in terms of a lot of the sort of problems and everything else. And But one of the things that I, I just feel like there's always been um, stuff in youth culture that is kind of out of our control, that's pretty nasty, that, you know, kids are kind of going to do and read and come across. and. The one thing that we can do is to make education something that's not that. And yet what we are doing is we are turning school into Instagram. Yeah. That's what we're doing. That's the problem. So what we need to do is kind of go back to this sense where we say, well, school is a different, you know, kids shouldn't be having phones in schools, right? They shouldn't be having devices. They should be learning to read and talk and discuss. Mm -hmm. Teachers, I think, you know, it's a on the, the, the social justice activism thing, it's exhausting all of this stuff. I'm sure a lot of teachers would be just really happy if they were told that they could just go and teach maths um, or whatever their subject is. I teach sociology. I, I teach about inequality and racism and sexism and all of these things. This is the bread and butter of what I do. But still, that is very different to the kind of EDI agenda stuff that you're also having to kind of compensate for. Mm -hmm. And I think we could, we, if we were to really just focus on education, you know, the project of education, and say what children need is this um, access to a way of thinking that allows them a space out of themselves, allows them to try and be a bit more objective, um, and that is not the same as real life. I think that could be really, really protective. Yeah, sure. That sounds like a really good idea. James, do you want to add to that? And then we'll have to uh, wrap up this discussion. Yeah, I mean, the technology is undoubtedly a problem. Um, I come across practices that I could only define as uh, grooming. Um, however, what I would say is we, we've known for quite a long time that technology is a problem and there are ways to limit it and for parents to try as, as best as possible to kind of um, monitor what their children are doing. Uh, but however, what I would say is controversially better the devil you know, because I think historically parents could feel, well, at least when my child's at school, and ideally there won't be any phones on them, at least I know then they'll be given, you know, a, a well-rounded education in the world and in life. And actually, time and time again, I'm hearing from parents that they have the fear of God put in them because they've got no idea what their children are being exposed to in the classroom. And there's no real way for them to monitor it. You know, there isn't an app where they can just kind of dial in and look at what's being taught. I know parents who've requested teaching materials from schools and they refuse to provide it. I spoke to a mother recently who raised concerns with the school about what their child's been taught. And the school suggested that maybe she might want to send her daughter somewhere else. I mean, this is what parents are dealing with. Yeah, absolutely, James. I think 
We'll wrap this up now, but um, I'm sure that the audience have got some questions that they'd like you to answer. So thank you very much for having that conversation with me. Um, I'm just having a little look through here. Um, somebody, Ellie, here we are, Ellie. Ellie is asking, what is your opinion of homeschooling as a response to the problems that you're discussing? Um, Jenny, what do you think about that? Homeschooling, is that the answer? Oh, do you want me to answer? Sorry, sorry. It just uh, look. I, I'm I'm very I'm very ambivalent about homeschooling. Oh, I mean, really? you know, I don't. I mean, I I'm, I completely support parents' right to do it if that's what they they want to do. I mean, I think you you cannot have a free society in which parents are told that they have to send their kids to a particular kind of school. You know, and so if they're being educated, kind of that's fine. But I do think there's something very importantly social about school um, and that it is about the community of adults as a whole, taking responsibility for the community of children as a whole. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea that, you know, education should just be something that, you know, a parent does with their child in, in that way. So, you know, wouldn't ban it, but I don't really think, I don't get wild about it as a solution. I'd rather sort the schools out. Sure, sure. Um, and we actually have got a question coming up on that, but uh, do, do either of you, James or Christine, have any particular view about homeschooling? Yeah. Um, I, I, I do. I agree with Jenny on this. The socialization part is a huge problem. Well, what some of the parents have started to do out here is to do sort of a group homeschooling. So they rotate among the parents and the kids so that there's a group of five or six or seven kids that each week or whatever a parent rotates and being in the role of the educator. That was sort of a compromise for them between the disconnection of the social contact and not being able to be around other kids your age and also to solve this issue of they don't like what is being taught at school. That was one idea for us to hear school choice. Uh, if we are able to, so the district you live in here, if you're going to public school is where you go to school. Okay, so, you know, all of your, you know, tax dollars from the, the city go toward that. And so that's where you go. When they open up, opened up to school choice, what they found is at least here, when parents had the ability to move their kids, so the money followed the child, not the school, they were able to pick schools and programs that were better suited and were more about what they wanted their kids to be learning. So that in and of itself solved some yeah. of the issue that yeah. we were having um, by yeah. just giving them that option. That's so those great. are two, yeah. two things that came up that okay. were possibilities that have shown some, yeah. some promise, some, okay. I would say, not, not all. James, do you have a particular view on this or would you like me to move on to the next question? Uh, I, I, I echo what's been said. I understand yeah. the desperation yeah. and wanting to take children out, but my plea would be to stay put and challenge what the schools are doing because that's the only way we're going to make it change. Okay, which leads me neatly on to our next question, which is from Stuart Baird. How can we encourage secondary teachers <clears throat> to defend their subjects and the curriculum space that they need to encourage critical thinking and oppose the encroachment of critical social justice that seeks to politicise their subject? How can parents support subject teachers? So there's a couple of questions in there, really. So who wants to kick off? Jenny? <laughs> yeah, well, as, as an educator, you know, how did we become so craven? It is bizarre. I mean, we all go into education because we like our subject, or maybe we love our subject. Certainly we think our subject's important. Certainly we think it's a subject. You know, we've trained in it. You know, this is what we do. And I think it's just really interesting how timid people are about standing up for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think also parents know. I mean, parents know that learning maths and English and, you know, whatever, geography, science, is really important. You know, they know that it's more important than all the other stuff that, that, that kids go to school for. So we, we don't really need to be that defensive. So I, I do think there is a, a kind of a solidarity to be had around um, this kind of question of, you know, let teachers do what they're good at. Mm -hmm. You know, leave them alone. Stop making them do all this other stuff. Because I know a lot of teachers go along with it, but mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessarily what they choose. And that's not what they got into teaching to do. Mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting, Jenny, because I think we're kind of making the assumption that they're all social justice activists, but perhaps some of them are just following 
on, you know, being told what that's what they have to do. You know, they get a whole load of books in to the library teaching children about race. But actually, you know, perhaps we do need to go back to expecting them to do what they're there to do and allowing them to do what they're meant to do. And any other views from the other panelists on that? I, I want to echo that real quick. It's very frightening. I, I was a professor of clinical psychology at a school and I resigned because of the CSJ. And I was very open and public about why I resigned and I was open with our provost. And this is you know graduate school, so these are you know adults already, but this is what disturbed me when I explained why uh, the provost's answer was, oh, lots of you know other professors feel the way you do, but we need to do something with diversity. So I think we're just gonna go on with this. That was the answer. I don't think it's most people, mm. teachers, educators at any level, as much uh, as it appears to be. I, I, I just don't. And that was frightening that they themselves didn't even adopt the ideology, but still mm. sort of rammed it down our throats in a sense. So there may be a kind of self-censoring going on here um, from those who are running schools. Uh, what, what do you think about this, James? Do you have any view on this? I think the problem for teachers is that these ideologies have seeped into things and places in which they're not even relevant. You know, teachers have been told diversity, equality, inclusion, that's everyone's business. And, you know, you might have a maths teacher who just wants to sit down and teach algebra, but when he's presented with a child in front of them saying, these are my pronouns, use them, they're caught up in it, even if they never intended to be so in the first place. And I think that's the issue. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Let, let's move on to our next question. Um, Joanne Nadler, um, who says they're interested in the conversation about social media and wondering where the panelists stand on regulating in view of the ongoing debate here in the UK about the online harms bill. Are we at risk of limiting free speech if we attend to these issues? So. Who'd like to kick off on that? James, do you have any views on that? <laughs> um, I, I think it's a, it's a difficult line to balance, you know, and I, th I think particularly around things like uh, age verification for pornographic materials online, you know, that's somewhere where we definitely do need to be clamping down on this. However, you know, there are, there are concerns that, it, that this legislation and the bill in its current format might stymie free speech as well. Um, uh, yeah, I, I find myself kind of going back and forth on this as well, because similarly, you know, educators, teachers, I believe that they should have the freedom to believe w w whatever they want. And certainly, you know, outside of the classroom, I believe they should have the freedom to say whatever they want. But it's different when it's children. You know, if you have child safeguarding at the heart of what you're doing, it, it's different. And if you remember that education is not meant to be indoctrination. Uh, I think even if we do curtail technically a teacher's freedom of speech in the classroom, that's not a bad thing. Mm, okay. Do either of you, either of you have a view? Yeah, Jenny. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I well, I, I think the implications of the online harm bill for freedom of speech are quite significant, mm. um, and um, and I, I find it irritating. I think it's a really performative bill, you know. And I think what we what we what is being done through this. Is it's a kind of, kind of a classic thing. You're, there's an attempt to skirt the moral argument by trying to have some kind of legal solution to it, which kind of is like this scattergun approach. Of, oh, that's nasty. That's nasty. That's nasty. Let's ban it without a thought as to how or who decides. I mean, who decides is always the big question in this. You know, um, the fact that kids get around. We know this, right? Kids get around all kinds of things online that you, that you might put in place. So I'm not really, I'm not arguing for a free for all, but I'm saying I don't think this stuff, you're know, trying to get rid of harmful content will work when the bigger problem is that we as a society haven't agreed on what is harmful, you know, and we're doing all of this harmful stuff through schools, as we've said. Mm. So that's really my position on that. I would say no online harms bill, but yeah, we do need to have a discussion about the harms that are around, including the ones that are kind of uh, perpetuated online. Mm. Okay, yeah, it, it's a difficult one, isn't it? But, um, okay, let's um, just take another question um, from Rob this time. This is an interesting one. Um, I was raised as a Roman Catholic, uh, so I had a strong set of beliefs taught to me, but yet I'm now an atheist. To what extent can we trust kids to grow up and figure these issues out for themselves? Who wants to kick off with that? <laughs> 
Christine, would you like? Have you got any views on that? Yeah, I mean that's 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 a challenging one. I'm not sure actually. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I guess what I'm leaning toward here is the exposure to multiple religions, viewpoints, spiritual practices, etc., is going to more support these kids or young adults that are growing figure out what and 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 what they believe in, what they want to practice. I mean, as a, as a psychotherapist, and when I was a professor as well, one thing is that most of the people that I taught or my colleagues were atheists. That actually is something that was very prevalent um, in that group. So I don't know where the, that came from. I don't know why it, 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 it came to that point, but we were almost not even allowed to use the words God or religion in school and in, in teaching. So I think that if there is exposure to that and it is not deemed to be, you know, um, that you are unfit to practice or that you're crazy if you believe in God or if you believe in an afterlife, all of those things that are attached, at least to this profession, that there's always a psychological reason somebody does something and they negate maybe the potential spiritual part or a role that God plays in their lives or, or that they believe they're being led you know, um, to a calling into the profession, that is completely shamed. So I think, again, if we're talking about the idea of free speech or free presentation of ideas, it's more likely that the kids or the adults are going to find their way through that if they're encouraged. I mean, I went to Catholic high school and took a world religions class, and we were encouraged to go and, you know, go to a Buddhist temple or something else that was outside of Catholicism because uh, to have a, a wider understanding of what, what, what's out there, that wasn't off the table. Now religion's totally off the table. So I think that's something that was um, helpful and would be helpful, but uh, again, with just not being able to have the space to say those things, um, I, I couldn't say I believe in God. That was not gonna be okay in my classroom and I'm just teaching adults. So I think that limits, obviously, but the exposure, if we're able to do that, I think is more likely people will find their way into mm -hmm. what they believe or don't believe. But that's mm -hmm. shut down as of now, I can tell you out here. I think that that's the problem, isn't it? That you're not allowed to have, you're only allowed to have one set of beliefs. Um, you, you know, you're not free to kind of explore and find out what other beliefs you might have that are important to you. Jenny? Well, I was just going to say briefly, I mean, indoctrination doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to remember that it comes from a position of weakness. And it's in these, when people are going to week that they're doubling down and trying to do this. So in a sense, I'm, I'm less worried about the fact that the kids will grow up believing all of these things. So I don't think they will, you know, I mean, you know, but that's not the point. The point is it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong to do it. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff that they're missing whilst there's these kind of ideas really being pushed through. Sure. James, do you have a view on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I fundamentally believe that one of the roles of adults is to offer a space to children to explore, to experiment, to, to, to grow and to learn about themselves, but ideally free from harm and certainly free from irreversible harm. And I think that's one of the issues I've got with gender ideology, for example, which is that we're basically robbing children of that opportunity. Uh, and the decisions we're forcing them into making at a young age can never be undone, even if years down the line they live to regress it. And it's very different to the kind of fads that we may have seen in the past. You know, I mean, I'm sure we all remember, you know, emo or goth culture, and maybe parents didn't particularly like it. But at the end of the day, you know, the child could decide, actually, I'm going to take off the black jacket and the lipstick and all the rest of it, and I'm going to go on and live my life. Whereas now, when it comes to things like puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, they can't do that. So I think we've robbed children of one of the wonders of childhood, which is experiment and grow and explore without harm. Mm, sure. Actually, that's interesting on that point. There is another question um, which from Bonnie, which you may be able to answer here, James, regarding cross-sex hormones. Do we have any research on the effects on the next generation if a trans adolescent goes on to reproduce? Is there any findings on this yet? I mean, we don't, we don't even have the research on the long-term effects on the individual that's taking the medication, let alone kind of yeah. spring. But the, the key issue around puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones is, is infertility, actually. More than oh, anything. really? Okay, okay. Well, look, I think um, 
this has been such an interesting discussion and, and I'd like to thank you all, but it would be quite useful if each of you could perhaps give us your kind of closing comments after this discussion before we bring it to a close. So who would like to start? Go on. Bo <laughs> Go I on. can start. It's okay, because I actually okay. was going to address Bonnie's okay, question please. about what is innocence and the definition. So I mm. talked about that briefly, but uh, essentially the definition of innocence is not having experience or knowledge about complex aspects of life. That would be what the definition, I guess, loosely would be versus experience, which is having life experience in complex matters or an understanding of things based on one's own level of experience or observation of others. I, so I think that's kind of what those two differences would, would be. It's um, interesting that the opposite of innocence is experience, but I think it's helpful to frame it that way because experience isn't necessarily ignorance. It's more about a lack of the um, exposure or the the experience of life, uh, not a willful denial of anything in particular, um, or a lack of willingness to learn or something like that. So that's, I guess, the best we can maybe come up with when it comes to kids. But I would just say in general, I mean, you know, the, the conversation, this is not an easy solution. I don't think there's an easy answer here. Um, and that's demonstrated by the fact that even with all of the interest that we got in these presentations I was talking about from, you know, from school, you know, boards and whatnot, at the end of the day, uh, adopting it was a different story. So I guess uh, the best I can say is right now, and this is what I've told parents here, is the best thing they might be able to do is to enforce their roles as parents in a much more, you know, assertive fashion that they help their children understand that the be all and end all isn't necessarily the set of beliefs that a teacher presents. That's, that's not, that can, they can question that and that that's okay. And in some ways the parents are going to override what the teacher has to say. And it's not about not being respectful to the teacher, but about helping the kids, kids learn about, and I think this is valuable in general. You don't need to agree or believe in everything that you're taught or shown or whatever, you know, to extent that that works right there is a critical learning uh, skill that they can do and sit and explore with their child, maybe in a different way of thinking about it. And I think that's the, the, the best I could give them. We weren't able to change things at the school board level. So they had to change things at home, which is about becoming a lot more engaged in that and that it's okay to disagree and be respectful still and helping them pour through all of that. Um, that's kind of where, where that lands. Thank you very much, Christine. Jenny, what are your closing comments? Yeah. I think the, the single most important thing that we as the society can give to children is a decent education. Yes. Um, and I think what would be really great, but obviously quite difficult, is if parents and teachers could make common cause in standing up for that. You know, um, so for teachers to do their, co their core role as educators and for parents to have their co core role as the people responsible for who children are mm -hmm. and basically tell everyone else to go away. Mm -hmm. That would be the, <laughs> the, 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 that would be, that's my little dream. That would be, I don't think it's parents versus teachers. I think there is a, a, a common cause there and it would be great if that happened. That's good to hear, Jenny. Thank you. And then finally, James. I mean, look, this is depressing stuff. Even as I was talking earlier, I found myself getting increasingly depressed. However, I'm tempted to kind of finish on a note of optimism, which is that I, I do genuinely believe it is possible to undo this. And my plea to parents that are listening is to keep speaking out about this. Challenge your school. Don't be afraid to have frank conversations with your children and just keep having the wider conversation in society because there are like-minded individuals out there and we will support you because the stakes are just too high not to. But I believe we can change. That's a really nice optimistic note to end on, James. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you all. Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you, James. Uh, we've had a really stimulating and insightful discussion. Uh, thank you very much to the audience for joining us for this webinar and for asking some really good questions. And thanks to Rob and Justine who have not been seen for your technical support. 
And thank you to Alka from Don't Divide Us and Bonnie and Paul from Terra Firma for hosting. Um, I should just let you know that um, the Scottish Union for Education, who are known as Sue, are holding a free online event next Thursday, the 2nd of March, where Stuart Wayton will be in conversation with the parent and author Nancy McDermott discussing the parent revolts taking place in America around concerns that education is becoming a form of indoctrination. You can find it on Eventbrite and it's called Parent Power in America. And there it is. It's popped up in the chat where you can find it. So um, if you want to find out more about Don't Divide Us um, and you want to find out more about Terra Firma, then their websites, um, I don't think don't Divide Us has gone up yet, but it's don'tdivideus.com. Uh, and Terra Firma is tfteach.org. Um, and you can hopefully see that. Yep, they're both up in the chat. Um, if anybody would like Christine's slides, uh, please contact Don't Divide Us by emailing team at don'tdividers.com. And if you found the discussion this evening helpful, um, if you're in the UK, you may wish to donate to Don't Divide Us. And if you're in the US, then to Terra Firma to help them com continue the really essential work that they're doing to support children and parents and teachers. Thank you all very much and goodbye. <laughs>